Thank you, Reverend Rebecca, for that powerful reading and for welcoming me here today. And to the green team for asking me to come and speak. It's my honor, and I have to say I'm, I'm also really so moved already by this incredible space that you all are holding for each other on this day, Earth Day, and every Sunday. It must be a very beautiful community to be part of. Thank you for having me be part of it today. So happy Earth Day. Happy Earth Day. Thank you. I work for the Union of Concerned Scientists, a science-based nonprofit working for a safer, healthier world. But I'm here today as myself, a mom, a gardener, a woods and a beach walker, a listener of birds. And while I usually rep the science, I'm not really here to do that. Science is so critical. Without it, we have no good policy, no good plans. We're flying blind. But here in 2024, on Earth Day or any day, it's important to speak directly to each other's hearts about what we're seeing and what it means to us. Earth Day and I were both born in 1970. And back in that first year, 20 million people, an astonishing 10% of the entire US population participated in some kind of Earth Day event. And in many ways, the environmental movement was born. Over time, since then, so many things have improved. You can be in the market basket parking lot, I have been, and see a bald eagle overhead and think, oh, cool. <laughs> some things have worsened, and some problems have emerged and taken center stage, like climate change. And though our concerns have grown, our ability and our willingness to get out and do something are not keeping up as Earth's problems get bigger. That makes a lot of sense. In the face of huge problems like climate change, we struggle to feel like our actions make a difference. And when we feel like we're beset by a huge problem that we can do little to stop, that very rationally creates fear and anxiety. And when climate or eco-anxiety is sustained over time, it can take a toll on our hope for the future. And this feeds in action. So that's what I'm going to talk about. We face a crisis of climate anxiety and hopelessness just when we have no time to lose and no one to spare. We need resilient hearts and minds resolved to see this through. That's why I chose the most audacious, immodest title I could think of for this sermon, Our Hearts in the Age of Climate Change, Why to Hope and How. And I must say, I've been sweating bullets ever since then. <laughs> I have struggled, I will own, I have struggled to live up to my own billing, to know how gentle to be and how honest. And I don't know if I'll get that quite right, certainly not for everyone, but know that I come in love. So why do I say we have a crisis of hopelessness? Because millions and millions of people say they struggle to hope for the future, young people in particular, and climate change is the key reason. An important 2021 study found that around the world, large majorities of young people have deep anxiety about the future because of climate change. They don't expect good things in the years ahead because of climate change. So many of them don't want to have children because of climate change. I don't think those of us who are older sit with that enough. On our watch, a world has grown up around today's children and people just coming of age that is for so many of them breaking their hearts and crushing their spirits. I don't think we sit with that injustice and it is a profound injustice. And it's not just them. I know many of you have asked yourself some version of the question with climate change, what can I really do? Do I even matter? 
I know others have asked some version of the question, with climate change, is there any hope? For others, I might not be speaking to you directly, but there's someone dear to you who's struggling with this. And to be clear, the struggle to hope in 2024 isn't a deficit. This isn't a mental illness, though it can progress into that. This is a rational response to what we're seeing and experiencing. There are a thousand different reasons why you might be having this really rational response. None of them good. This is the hard part of my talk, but we've got to do it. So please, I want to take a moment and bear witness to some of those reasons. It could be that you watched 2023 shatter temperature records by a very wide margin, shocking scientists and crushing people amidst heat waves and other extremes. It could be that you're watching 2024 continue that march with each month clocking in as the hottest in history, the hottest June, the hottest January, 10 months and counting. It could be that you've read about the so-called tipping points we're inadvertently toying with, like the dieback of the Amazon forest, or the collapse of the Gulf Stream, or the world's major ice sheets, which would be, let's just say, consequential. It could be that you know, because you've watched the floods in Pakistan, the wildfires in Australia, right now, today, you're watching, as Reverend Rebecca spoke of, the many millions of people in Africa who face climate-driven drought and food shortages, or you're watching what scientists expect will be the worst global coral bleaching event in history unfolding right now. It could be that you know we need deep emissions cuts by 2030, now just six years away, in order to avoid the more devastating consequences of climate change, but global heat trapping pollution is still rising. It's not rising much, but it's still rising when it needs to be free falling. That's enough to challenge our hope. Or it could be, and I promise this is the last one, but it's important. It could be that you know fossil fuel companies are presently making their strongest profits in recent history, and they're doing so after decades of deception about the climate harm caused by their products. They're doing it while bankrolling politicians who obstruct climate action, while greenwashing, and telling us to mind our carbon footprint as if this is all on us. And they're doing it while running down the clock and degrading and diminishing the future for every young person alive and yet to be for a flickering moment of profit. It's enough to make a person angry. And I don't think we sit with that enough either. The immorality and the criminality of the fossil fuel industry and the interests that support it it's madness that today's children are inheriting a world that we could have been so much safer and healthier and more vibrant, but corporate interests have driven it into such danger on our watch and with our participation, willing or not. I feel for us in this because in truth, we're not so well built for a problem like climate change. It's so big it's so long-term, it's so everything. Our minds struggle to hold it all, to see its true significance, and to see how we can change and respond to something at such a scale. So I think we can be forgiven for asking those questions. What can I really do? Is there hope? OK, so I think that was the hard part. And my apologies, but you know, we, we have to do it. Time's a waste and the candy coating days are over, and now I want to talk about why to hope. There are so many reasons. You surely have your own. Here are just a few that I chose to lift up. We should hope because there's still time, and every tenth of a degree matters. On the time part, mm, there's not much. You know that dream we've all had where it's the night before finals and we've been blowing off class for months? <laughs> and we spent our book money on beer and now we have a matter of hours to pass this test? That's, that's us. And that's a steep climb. 
you know, nice job, kid, but here we are. But when we bring our carbon and other heat trapping emissions to net zero, the atmosphere can stop warming relatively quickly, potentially within a decade. If we can do that before mid-century, we've got a solid shot at keeping temperatures below that two degrees C target that we hear spoken about, the threshold beyond which dangerous and cascading impacts are expected. But in reality, there's no magic number. Every tenth of a degree matters. Every tenth of a degree is worth fighting for. And there will never be a point where there's no point in trying. We should hope, because the natural world is incredibly powerful, and given half a chance, ecosystems change and rebound. We will not save everything, and that will be to our lasting shame. But there is so much that can endure and flourish if we work harder now to change. And we should hope because things are changing. Wind and solar power are rapidly overtaking coal-fired plants in our electricity mix. EVs are everywhere. We're making massive, unprecedented federal investments in our clean energy and transportation futures. Gradual, positive change doesn't sell, so we don't see it, but it's happening. We should hope because even larger scale change can come quickly if we create the conditions. And because the things that hold us back, the obstacles to those changes, are really, at the end of the day, just stories we keep telling each other. Bill McKibben said recently that too many people in power are acting as though economic reality and political reality somehow mean more than reality. <laughs> but those two man-made realities depend entirely on the stories that underpin them, so let's stop repeating them and start telling better ones. Our dependence on fossil fuels and the riskiness of clean energy is one such story. It was never true. It was just a story hawked by powerful, profit-seeking interests that too many of us repeated or didn't challenge for too long, and it landed us here. But you can see that story losing its grip on us. It's time to close that book, and put it in the dustbin of history, and sue them into the next millennium. Happy to talk about that over lunch. <laughs> we, we should hope, because the idea that the future will inevitably be worse than the past, that's also just a story, and we should stop telling that one. It could be far worse. But the past was no picnic for so many people who lived it, and the future could be where we find peace, justice, equity, community, connection thriving, where we transform in the ways we need to as individuals and communities and societies. Let's tell that story. We should hope because we have scarcely begun to tap the power of the collective we, but across much of Western culture, I'm sorry, in your congregation's community, you probably have a sense of the power of collective action. I can see that. But across much of Western culture, the prevailing mindset is one of action through individual agency and responsibility. I have to solve climate change. No, you don't. You just have to put some skin in the game on a team. We're in this together. Let's start acting, organizing, and fighting like it. And lastly, we should hope because it's our job. It's our job to hope. When older people talk about what gives them hope, it's often the brave activism of young people, which I get, but also, no. That's not fair. We need to flip that script. Many of those young people feel betrayed by us. They learned about the climate crisis, they looked to us, they saw inaction, and they feel betrayed and abandoned. That's not me, that's that 21 study I mentioned. But I sure do feel it. Adults need to take action that give younger people hope. Like the Swiss grannies you may have heard about, the 2,000 Swiss women over 64 who just won a landmark climate case in the EU's highest human rights court. 
love to talk more about that over lunch. It's not our job to decide what's unrealistic, what's too idealistic, what can't be done. It's our job to come with a sense of responsibility to try, and trying is hoping. OK, so how to hope? My short answer is, don't worry about it, which I'll explain. My longer answer is the last thing I'm going to share with you today. It's a poem from an anthology that was published last fall to accompany the latest National Climate Assessment. This poem came about because I was heartbroken. And I was watching my climate colleagues, scientists, activists, policy experts, heartbroken and grieving and weary. And I realized there's no way to take this away other than denial or giving up. So we have to understand it, and we have to hold it closer and alchemize it. Here in 2024, your heart may be breaking. It may be broken for nature, for our nation's toxic politics, for Gaza. We're all in some way grieving. And that's a price we pay for being human in this moment in our history, a moment that is taught, terrible, and possibly transformational, but not transformational yet. It needs us. It needs you and your gritty, miraculous hope. And now, if you'll indulge me, I'll read that poem. Called You, My Weary Friend. Thank you for listening. It was the reefs at first. I can see your face. Kaleidoscopic dreamscapes of infinitesimal architects. A biologic blockbuster that suddenly must end. You said, tell me there's another galaxy with coral. It was the bears too, but you don't say so. Apex beasts in white prowling the ice at the top of the world. You said, Milky Way, top that are a done deal and somehow cliche, so you spare yourself the mocking of your broken child heart. It was them and the rest and suddenly was everything that makes the world shimmer and always made you know why you came here from dark nothing. You once walked through a world of wounds, but wounds are for healing. You walk now through a world of ghosts, half not yet knowing they are the dead. Until the toad climbs, from the cloud forest muck to chirp his springtime call and no one in the wide universe answers, you said, then he knows. And I thought I glimpsed a ghost of you. You felt it grow thin. You started to grieve, to rage, and sometimes to panic, looking for the door or the way off this ride. You felt it tear, and suddenly it was too late. All those fights, long and frantic, were over and lost. And then you didn't feel it at all. It was gone, sublimated from your soul like vapor from ancient ice. But listen, it's not that easy to lose hope. In English, we say, hope springs eternal. In Russian, it's hope dies last. It's the same unbidden pulse. In this world, if you love anything, you hope. You move. You press. You keep. You don't even get to decide. You can watch the leaves fall from your hope. A bird here, a town there, a glacier, its river, their people. Sometimes you hear it on the radio in thick traffic, and you urgently scan the fuming hardscape for something to make sense. Sometimes you know because you wait in season, in place, and it never arrives, arrested en route. And the leaves fall until all hope's branches are beautiful bones before a gathering sky. But don't be fooled. There's more to hope than that. However weak you see it, or dead you think it, or hard you mourn it, this hope thing endures in the dark, where deep roots sense scorched earth and blind and silent, but with the unrelenting green fuse force of life dig deeper still. 
However frail you think it, whatever name you call it, hope will not, cannot quit. It relinquishes, shapeshifts, detaches from the object of its desire, and hews only but so closely to its driving spark. And therein lies hope's unstoppable power. If you love anything, you hope. Not for this, not for that, that was then. Your hope has since mutated and evolved. You stop saying, I'm going to have to hope for the best. Now you say, I'm going to have to fight like hell. And that's the bad news. You're going to have to fight like hell without hope of winning. There's no winning anymore when so much is lost. There's only what remains. But look, it's still beautiful. I'll fight for that. Whatever you fought for, whoever's in your locket, the fight is now for what is left. That is all, and that is everything. And you, my weary friend, will never stop. Thank you. <laughs>